learning points. So uh, without further ado, so getting into the case and introducing our discussants, we've got uh, Guy, who's uh, currently on cardiology, hanging out with us in here. We have Viri, uh, currently on wards, Rob, one of our third year med ped residents hanging out, and then Tevi uh, just walked in as well. So those are the four people who are going to crush this case. All right, so uh, I'm going to keep track of some of the cases we go up here on the board, and then we're going to alternate between that and the whiteboard, uh, and then I'm going to let the discussions in here uh, get to the bottom of this. So for our first uh, aliquot of information, we have got the chief complaint of unconsciousness. So this is a 71-year-old woman who was admitted last night to the medical ICU at University of Colorado. She has a history of depression and suicidal ideation, and she's presenting with unconsciousness. Per the family, she became gradually more unconscious, in quotes, over the past two days. And the family states that she lives alone. And over the past two days, she's said when they come to check on her, she's been moaning, lethargic, and unable to rise from her chair. EMS was finally called when she was noted to be unresponsive and moaning more. So not technically unresponsive, but not really responsive to any sort of stimuli from the family. The family states she lives independently. She performs all of her ADLs by herself. They state she has never attempted suicide in the past. She has no recent hospitalizations or visits to the doctor. And they are unsure if she takes any medications or has any medical problems. So with that first uh, piece of information, you are discussing in the room. Uh, someone feel free to give me your thoughts. Anything else we learned from EMS about the way they, the way they found their meds at the scene? Perfect. So Rob asked, is there anything else we learned from EMS? Uh, great question. So um, EMS tells you that when they found her, she was basically slumped over in a chair. She was not surrounded by any medication. Um, and she was um, essentially alone in a corner of her house. Um, they um, have some vitals, which we'll get to in a second. And then Dan Trueweiler uh, said, what's the glucose? And the glucose in the field was undetectably high. Um, what do they mean by gradually more unconscious? Like, does, does that mean, she, did she ever pass out? Like, was she ever unresponsive or was she, did she just sort of alter it? Yeah, good question. So, uh, uh, getting at a really important point, like clarifying family history and what gradually unresponsive means. So she, uh, over a two day period, essentially stopped talking, um, stopped communicating with family and became less mobile and essentially stayed in her chair for longer and longer periods of time until she wouldn't respond to her name, to touching her uh, and to yelling at her. And she basically refused to move from this chair. So refused to move was the family's word, but she was unable to remove from, uh, from her chair. So with all that being said, for the discussants in the room and anyone on chat who wants to participate, um, I'm going to throw up the whiteboard here and let's, uh, let's build like a really basic differential based on sort of this initial EMS HPI. So for altered mental status, I mean, for that, with that really high glucose, like a a DKA or a hyper, like an HHS. Perfect. So Tevi says DKA or HHS with that high glucose. Excellent thought. Um, any sort of infection, sepsis, pneumonia, meningitis. Perfect. <clears throat> Still certainly could be some sort of ingestion. Either a stroke. I think that's great. So what you guys are hitting at right now, and I know we've talked about this sort of ad nauseum this year, is this mis mnemonic. So metabolic, infectious, or ingestions, um, S standing for stroke, seizure, or structural abnormalities, and then T, the one that we're not really getting a history for here is trauma. Uh, but I think that's a really excellent way that you guys are framing this initial diagnosis. So she's altered. And then we're thinking about metabolic, infectious, ingestion, and then sort of uh, neurologic abnormalities. Okay, so let's return to the case. I think you guys are all interested in getting uh, more information here. All right, so uh, I'll defer to you guys. Do you guys want uh, additional past medical history, surgical history, and social history, or would you prefer to go right to her vitals and her exam? Let's, let's get a little bit more history. 
All right, we got some degree disagreement in the room. So uh, Parissa, Parissa, who joined us, said she wants vital. The GA is on the cards I see. was like, nah, give me history. So uh, show of hands, who wants history? All right, Teresa lost that uh, by a not insignificant vote. All right, so additional history. So per Epic Review, she has a history of major depression and a history of suicidal ideation, but no other listed sort of auto-populating uh, medical diagnoses. She has no surgical history, as far as you can tell, and the family confirms that. And social history, she has no tobacco, alcohol, or drug use history. Family says she's never used any of these products, as far as they know. And like I said previously, she lives alone and performs all of her ADLs independently. So, yeah, you asked for some history. How does this change your thought process? Um, currently, right now, not by much. Um, uh, I, I think uh, maybe finding out a little bit more about her medications, um, probably your social situation as well. One thing I'd like to know, um, just something that you brought up earlier, EMS founder sitting alone in the car. Um, you always think about elder abuse as well. Yeah, I think that's great. So Gia mentions an excellent point. So the, the clue in the history that she was alone in her house, um, you know, she allegedly performs her ADLs independently, but we should always have a high suspicion for uh, elder abuse and elder neglect. The family says that um, she has a, a, um, a son who uh, allegedly checks on her a couple times per week, but they're unsure how often that's actually happening. Um, and they think she performs ADLs independently because they have very little contact with her on a weekly basis. And then medications we will get to in just a second. So, for that you were disappointed you didn't get vitals. Uh, do the, does the social history help clarify uh, the story or sort of push you one way or the other? I mean, I just walked in, so I don't know. But, yeah, the social history is helpful. Um, because if she was using substances, that could be a cause of her unresponsiveness. Um, With history of suicidal ideation, I would also start thinking a lot about what medication she's on, you know, what what sedating medication specifically, anything that she might have overdosed on. Great. So Viri uh, and and Bruce have both hit on this like, expertly. Um, the suicidal ideation on the chart, I think we see this in a lot of our patients, but actually sort of trying to hammer home uh, what that means and then really having sort of that prompt us then to look at her medications. I uh, completely agree. Okay, so this is another kind of choose your own adventure moment. Uh, would you guys rather see her medications next or would you rather get vitals and an exam? Medication. All right, so medications. I think we've got a unanimous vote now. Everyone <laughs> outside of <laughs> Carissa, medication. Okay, so let's give you some medications here. All right, so for those of you who are not aware of UCH, there's a pharmacy review uh, every single time a patient comes into the hospital and pharmacy will uh, do essentially a check of all pharmacies in the area and prescribing pattern uh, to tell you what the person is taking or not taking um, or when they're filling it. So per pharmacy search of prescribing practices in the Denver area, they show you this list of medications. So amlodipine, escitalopram, hydroxazine, metformin, mirabegron, omeprazole, resuvastatin, and levothyroxine. You are uh, unable to confirm a family that she has taken any of these medicines, um, but pharmacy does say that these have been prescribed at some point in the last 90 days. <clears throat> All right, you guys asked for medications. What are our thoughts on the medications? We have a lot of possibilities here. Um, I think that jump out to me, given that all we know right now is mental status, we don't know exam or vitals. Um, is Levothyroxine, certainly could be metformin too, um, hydroxazine, escitalopram, amlodipine too, potentially, but maybe a little bit less likely for her. Well, I have Beckman, and Anne looks pretty good as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And first, what is the, what do we use mirror background for? For some of us, for some of us who are not expert primary care doctors. A rapid platter. A rapid platter. Great. So, Krista and Rob, you know, Rob basically just said that everything about this medication list is concerning, uh, especially in a person who is unconscious or has an altered mental status, uh, which is great. And then Krista helpfully points out that Mirabegron, a medicine that um, I personally was not familiar with, is an anti-muscarinic that we use for overactive bladder. 
And so if you guys were going to prioritize medications on this list, sort of one through four, one being most concerning, four being still concerning but lower down, what would your uh, most concerning medication be? Uh, so Fury says, leave with Iraq and SA Talparam are going to be 1A and sort of uh, 1B. I don't think this was sort of like a slow progressive process to some extent, not just like an acute overdose where she was fine and then she wasn't, although admittedly our history just kind of got fuzzier with what we now know the family may or may not know. So I wonder if it's more of sort of like an anticholinergic sort of picture like what we're talking about here and this is a slow build, like she's got an AKI and then she's building up a couple of these medicines or something like that, um, more so than like acute. Perfect. Uh, so Rob using sort of clinical clues saying that this sounds like a more slowly progressive process, um, which maybe points more towards um, a slower overdose picture. So the anti-muscarinic and anti-cholinergic things here, Mirabegron and hydroxyzine. All right. Any additional questions on any of the information you guys have been provided so far? I will zoom back out here so you can see the full case again. All right. So before we get into before we get into vitals, labs, imaging, let's go revisit that differential one more time here. So, so we're going to revisit our DDX. Um, and so now, what you guys know about her sort of social history or medication, um, let's get a one through three here of things that we think are going on. Um, just broad categories of toxic metabolic is the top of my list right now. Great, so toxic metabolic. I'll just remind you guys that we definitely know that she's got a high blood glucose. I think infection is still up there. We don't have any reason any reason to think it's less likely infections at this point other than what's on that list. Any infection in particular you guys would be most concerned about? Um, why UCI? I'm assuming she has diabetes and high blood glucose, and then for age indications are more likely to present with diabetes. So, some really good discussion just went on. It was it was kind of a whisper level, but I want to I want to I want to highlight it because it was actually incredible. So, what Prisca said, Prisca said, I think this is probably a UTI, or I'd be concerned about a UTI. And the clinical clues that pointed her towards that were diabetes plus this person being elderly. And so they can present with encephalopathy or sort of altered mental status with their initial presentation. And then Guy jumped in to say that the other thing he's concerned about here is Mirabegron and sort of other stuff. So is she having any sort of uh, retention, which is then causing her to be more likely to have a, a urinary tract infection? So really, really jo good job there with clinical reasoning from uh, our slew of second year residents. Okay, and let's get one more thing on here. I mean, I don't know. I didn't get to read her whole history, but like, some girl, like, she's like has these falls. I don't know how like mobile or independent she is, but especially she's had like progressive altered mental status over the last two days. Like, maybe she's just like, Great. Perfect. So it falls complete. I love it. Okay. So before I show you guys the vitals and her physical exam, let's play a small game here. I want you guys to guess what you think her vitals are going to look like. So we'll start with temperature. Do you guys think she's going to be febrile, hypothermic, normal? Yeah. All right. So Gia gets his afebrile. Dan Treeweiler puts the vote in for hypothermic. Okay. Uh, heart rate, what do you guys think? Tachycardic. All right, we got a unifying <laughs> diagnosis that everyone thinks she's going to be tachycardic. And why do you guys think she's going to be tachycardic? It's going to be dry. So yeah, pulling down from not sitting in a chair. Yeah. All right, so, so clinical clues were saying she's dry, she's in a chair, she's for sure going to be tachycardic. I like the confidence. All right, blood pressure? 83 over 54. All right. Yeah, gives a single two numbers. So that is the definition of putting your nickel down. Oh, yeah. Uh, why do you think she'll be hypotensive? Um, same reason she'd be tachycardic. She's dry. She's going to be hypovolemic. 
I like it. And then uh, Dan Treeweiler is like just quoting things like a madman in the comments. So stop <laughs> looking for like Downey, great. And then uh, do you think she should be uh, hypoxic, normal? Yeah. I'd say normal yeah. Cool. So I think she's going to be normal. Great. So you guys are basically painting the picture of a person who, with a toxic metabolic problem, who's afebrile, maybe hypothermic, tachycardic because she's dry, hypotensive because she's dry, with a normal oxygen saturation. I like it. All right. So we go back to the case. And I regretfully have to report to you guys that you were largely wrong, uh, which is great. That's why we're doing this. So Dan Trelaw was actually correct. This lady comes in profoundly hypothermic at 31.8. She ends up not being tachycardic with a heart rate of 62. Blood pressure is 98 over 48, which is not too far off from what BA says. And she's setting 96% on room air. In general, she is an obese lady. She is very ill appearing. Her neuro exam, she's unresponsive to verbal tactile stimuli. She's moaning. She's not opening her eyes. And she's not following commands. She has very dry mucous membranes. Uh, she has regular rate of rhythm, no murmurs. She has very delayed capillary refill and cool extremities. And then her abdomen, uh, she is grimacing to very, very deep palpation. Jerry, what are your thoughts on this physical exam and vitals? So she does it on when she appears dry. Um, I guess first thought that comes to mind is she's hypothermic. Is one making sure it's not environmental? Does she not have the heat on at all, and that's part of what's contributing, or is it that maybe we're thinking something endocrinological since she does have a history of hypothyroidism? Awesome. So Viri jumps right into what's her differential for hypothyroidism or hypothermia. So her first thing was environmental. And so I'll tell you, this person was admitted yesterday when it was eight degrees in a large portion of Denver. Uh, so great point. Um, and so Viri says that she's just sitting in a chair without uh, heat uh, or lack thereof. And then Viri, what was the second thing you said? Oh, I just mentioned that makes me think about endocrinological problems with hypothyroidism. She does have, she does take leave of her. Also, thinking about endocrine problems, we know she's on the uh, I like that. And then what else is on our differential for hypothermia? Okay. Cool. Right. Sepsis. Yeah. 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 So sepsis and kind of more broadly infection, great. Um, remember, we don't typically use it as much, but one of our service criteria is actually, you know, temperature less than 36. Um, okay. I don't know what I just wrote there, but temperature less than 36 is actually one of our service criteria. And then anything else you guys think of for the hypothermia differential? This, this is a bit of a stretch, I'll admit, but um, any like thalamic strokes or hypothalamic strokes, like that, so I, I don't think I've ever heard or seen that happen, theoretically. Perfect, so thalamic strokes or like more generally like brainstem processes. And that's a great point because uh, typically what you guys will find is if you have a cardiac arrest patient, sometimes you, uh, you'll you think to yourself, do I even need to cool this person because they'll naturally be colder than you expect? And that's because the brain stem uh, and the hypothalamus controls our temperature set point. So absolutely uh, excellent point. Okay. All right. So she's hypothermic. We'll go back to our board here. She's hypothermic. She's not responsive. Is there anything else you guys wish uh, you knew about the physical exam? Uh, Did we talk about people? Yeah. Can you can you uh, um, make it bigger? Okay. I think we should always do this. I'm very blank. Do you like withdraw to pain in all extremities or? Yeah, so she withdraws the pain. Uh, so um, Tevi asked if she withdraws the pain. She does. She does definitely withdraw the pain. Does she have fever reactions? Her pupils are equal, and she's not having any pupillary abnormalities. Um, granted, this is an internal medicine uh, exam, and not your uh, in-depth neuro neurology exam. All right. So where do where do you guys want to go next in this workup? Maybe some labs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll do some labs. 
Uh, <laughs> would you guys prefer to have the EKG first or the labs first? Labs. 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 All right. So, in true fashion, I'm just going to throw every single lab that this person had at you to simulate um, what it feels like to admit one of these people from the ED. <laughs> So she has a leukocytosis. She has a large anion gap of 34 with a bicarb of 5. BUN is 75, creatinine is 2.9. Her sugar is 911. That's a real number, not 911 for fun. Uh, her phosphate is 6.8. <laughs> LFTs are normal. Her INR is normal as well. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to pick a resident in the room. There's three more sets of labs here, uh, which will be important for management. And so we'll say, Tevi, what are your thoughts on uh, sort of our basic labs here? Uh, just like on specific abnormalities, mm -hmm. or yeah. So talk me through. Talk me through. Uh, like think out loud about her CBC and her BMP. Okay. So her CBC. Uh, I mean, she has a elevated white count. So that's I guess infection. Um, higher on her differential. Um, her BMP. She's hypochloremic, which I really never know what to do with chloride. Um, Bicarb of five, very, um, yeah, uh, really high BUN as well. Um, and then I don't know what her baseline creatinine is, but if she was like, we didn't see anything on her medical history about CKD or any kidney issues, so it's a pretty elevated. Um, and they're really high glucose. Uh, that makes me think more about like HHS or DKA, especially with the the really high anion gap. Um, I guess well more DK than HHS because you wouldn't have an anion gap with HHS. Um, the phosphorus being high that makes me think her kidneys aren't working. That's, those are my main thoughts. Perfect. Um, awesome. That was great. So basically walking through concern for infection with the leukocytosis, uh, really low bicarb. I also don't know what to do with the low chloride level, so we're just going to pretend it doesn't exist for now. Um, high anion gap, and then expertly said that with a sugar that high, a bicarb that low, and an anion gap, your first through tenth thought should be DKA. And then just to introduce another kind of fun met uh, metabolic abnormality here. So uh, Tebby says that her FOS might be high because of her uh, kidney dysfunction, which is partly true. But um, being in DKA will also give you a high phosphorus. So having uh, being acidotic will cause phosphorus to shift out uh, into sort of the uh, extracellular space. So you can test it in the blood. And so if you correct someone's DKA, their phos will drop. And so just another thing to add to your uh, repertoire when you're evaluating a high phos. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll defer to Rob here. Rob, one of our third year resident in the room. Rob, after seeing these labs, what additional tests do you want to get? Uh, I'm really curious what her thyroid studies look like, um, and because of these, and also just apart from these, um, to see what that looks like. I would be curious to see what her beta hydroxybutyrate level is, and I'm curious to see a, at least a BBG on ABG. Cool. So Rob says ABG thyroid studies uh, beta hydroxybutyrate because Heavy brought up the concern for the DKA. Um, lactate. 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 Perfect. And the lactate, and then uh, beery and DKA. Those are working. Those are working. Wow. Cool. So uh, the next set of labs, um, I have made it red to make sure it's obvious. Uh, her ABG, she's got an acidosis of 6.96 with a PCO2 of 26 and a PO2 of 81 on room air. Trope is negative. DK is normal. Lactate is 2.2, which is basically normal. Her lipase is greater than 6,000. Her triglycerides are 600. Beta hydroxybutyrate is off the chart, uh, greater than 8. And her serum osmonds are 377 with a gap of 32. The DA is staring perplexed at the screen. So <laughs> appropriate, appropriate response to these labs. Uh, Gay, yeah, talk me through. Talk me through out loud what you're thinking with this sort of next set of labs. Yeah. Uh, so she's definitely acidotic. Um, she has a, uh, sorry, she has, yeah, metabolic acidosis, um, and her 
like case is really, really high. I have no idea why it's so high. Um, so that's a little bit weird. And then her beta hydroxy beta rate is appropriately elevated with a glucose of 911. I mean, I think this is like a mixed, I, I mean, just what it's facing right now is like some sort of mixed acid base disorder. Um, with probably multiple culprits, the biggest one being DK. I think that's great. So Gia invokes multiple culprits. We like waved our hands and said there's multiple culprits, which is the appropriate response to this. Yeah. Um, so in this case, uh, is the live case part of her presentation or is that sort of a red herring in these labs? She has abdominal pains on exam. So I mean, I don't really know what it has to do with like DKA or like what's her mixed picture, but I mean, she could be having pancreatitis from something else. Even in most of those negative pancreatitis, it's not that high. It's kind of moderate. And I've certainly seen a lot of cases where you have an elevated lipase without any other evidence of pancreatitis. But I don't actually have a good definition for that. Cool. So Viri, Viri says, um, patients with DKA can have an elevated lipase, but she has not often seen one this high. Um, and so it's hard to differentiate, as uh, Tevi said, whether this is pancreatitis, because there is abdominal pain, or this is DKA. And so um, everyone is correct in the room. So uh, one of the teaching points here is that you can have an elevated lipase in DKA, and you can also have abdominal pain in DKA. And so it makes it very, very difficult to differentiate um, between DKA-associated uh, abdominal pain versus pancreatitis. And so one thing to just track in your mind as you're admitting this person, uh, but hard to say what it, what, it, um, what it matters now. Okay, so you guys have enough to diagnose DKA, as you said, but uh, GA is still concerned about multiple culprits, and Rob brought up that he still wants to see the thyroid study. So you get a urine drug screen, which is also negative, and then calling back to what Parisa said about uh, 10 minutes ago, that UA has too many exclamation points. Uh, it is markedly abnormal, uh, and this was on a straight cat. Uh, and so uh, it's got a lot of protein, it has a lot of glucose, it has ketones, it has a lot of blood, white cells, red cells, it's the rainbow UA. And then Rob uh, gets his wish, and we have a lot of markedly abnormal thyroid studies. So Rob, you asked for the thyroid study, so uh, walk me through uh, what you see. Um, yeah, so I'm admittedly not a budding endocrinologist, but her TSH is awfully high. Her free T4 and total T3 are awfully low. Um, and she has a, this is a random cortisol level, I assume, that's um, certainly not low. Um, and so I'd say here her thyroid is doing next to nothing, um, and her levothyroxine is doing next to nothing for her. Um, and so she um, is very, very hypothyroid at the moment and probably um, is a big part of her, her clinical picture. But part of what I was wondering with her other labs is sort of is this a, is this a function of something else that's kicking these things off, um, which her, from an endocrinologic standpoint, her thyroid could certainly be responsible for sort of starting this cascade of what led her to um, have the labs we were talking about in the left earlier. Cool, that's great. So Rob, Rob is fantastic. So Rob says she is markedly hypothyroid, uh, and she is uh, really not doing her thyroid. Amazing. And then Anita invokes mixed edema coma, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Um, so let's go to uh, the whiteboard again. So Anita has said that the, this might be mixed edema coma. Uh, what do you guys think about that in the room? Agree. Yeah, yeah that's her presentation. One hundred percent. Agree. Great. And why? Why do you guys think this is mixed edema coma? And so you're hypothyroidism, hypothermia, and we're still on progressive status. Yeah, cool. Perfect. And you're saying the same thing. So severe hypothyroidism plus alter mental status plus <laughs> hypothermia should increase your clinical suspicion for mixed edema coma, which is great. So I think one of the confusing things about mixed edema coma is that um, is that a lot of times people don't actually present with coma. People present with like various degrees of delirium. And so another thing that people have sort of recommended calling this is just decompensated hypothyroidism. And so, right, we talk a lot about cirrhotics being decompensated, but we can also talk about people with uh, hypothyroidism being decompensated. And I think when you think about it sort of in that context, it makes it a lot easier to conceptualize. Like Rob said, that your thyroid's not doing anything uh, and you sort of have all these metabolic side effects as a result. 
So we'll talk more about mixed hematoma here in just a second, but what other problems does she have? So you guys identified one. What else are you going to need to treat in this person? PKA. Okay, so Gia says we're also going to need your PKA. UTI. UTI for and then Prisa says we're also going to treat her for UTI. Awesome. So getting right into it, we'll pretend that there is no endocrinologist at the university, a situation which will never happen. But how do you get them to treat her mixed edema coma? Airways and IV. Perfect. So Anita says IV Synthroid 300 micrograms, which is actually exactly what the endocrinologist said. Um, so why did Anita, uh, Tevi, why did Anita say she wanted to give it IV? Mm -hmm. This is bad because it's actually came up on round today and I can't remember. I think it's a formulation question because like, so like when we tie tightly with our oxygen clinic, you do it slowly and you, know, you start someone on the yeah. dose, you check them six weeks later because it's going to take them a while to um, actually have that effect. But I think the IV formulation is different and is, um, is just, like um, going to act right away as opposed yeah. to need to be metabolized or need to be um, activated. <clears throat> Perfect. So the, the, the fast answer is that it's just faster to get yeah. it from 300 IV. You get better absorption. Uh, and the reason you get better absorption is a lot of times these people have iliac and GI issues, which pre that prevents the oral absorption of medications. And so when everything slows down, um, you also get your GI tract slowing down, and that makes it very hard to absorb oral meds. So in the chat, uh, Natalie also mentioned Cytomel. Do you guys know what Cytomel is? So Natalie, what is Cytomel? You can just type it into the chat. This is one of those old school uh, chief tricks when you also don't know what Cytomel is. You <laughs> ask a resident to type it in for you and hope that they didn't walk away. Perfect, it's T3, that's what I hoped it was gonna be. Uh, so TC, so liothyronine is the other word for it. I guess it's also called cytomel, which is great. You learn something new every day. Um, and so this is T3. So why why did Natalie uh, want to give this person T3? The active, the active. form of thyroid, right? You guys are way better endocrine than I am. So this is the active form of thyroid hormone. Wait, so no steroids? We'll get to the steroids. Yeah, so this is the active form. And so uh, levothyroxine is T4. And so the reason that some people advocate giving T3 is that uh, when you are in a sort of decompensated hypothyroid state, your body has difficulty turning T4 into T3. And if you just go ahead and give the activated form of T3, uh, you can sort of speed the recovery and give them a jump start uh, on getting out of the coma. So it's sort of referred to as like a jump start uh, to get out of the uh, mixed edema coma. All right, and then finally, Carissa has been over here talking a lot about steroids. She uh, really, really, really wants to give this person steroids, and why is that? <laughs> I, I would imagine the steroids have something to do with thyroid metabolism. Um, I'm not really entirely sure. It would make, make it feel better. All right, so like all the time, we say that steroids would just generally make us feel better. Um, does anyone in this room with my discussants or uh, sort of on the chat know why we're going to end up giving this person hydrocortisone? Are you trying to give her a more balanced glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid rather than like full on glucocorticoid? Since she's already in DKA, she uh, probably is a little more balanced rather than. Yes, tell me. So, Parissa, so Rob brings up a good point about balance, uh, your glucocorticoids, which is always a good thing. But, Parissa, what, uh, what about the adrenal insufficiency? Uh, <laughs> so, Parissa is, is a, a 21st century twist, is rapidly scrolling through <laughs> to figure out why, uh, which, is, which is what you should do in this case. Um, yeah, she had a random cortisol in the 80s, though, right? Huh? So, she had a random cortisol in the 80s, which she is did, which was after she got hydrocortisone. Oh, uh, yeah. Got it. Okay. So Rob brought up a good point. She has a she has a random cortisol in the 80s, which is after she got hydrocortisone, which makes it sort of hard to interpret. Um, and so the reason you're giving this, like Chris has said, is you are going to prevent adrenal crisis. So until you know whether or not this person actually has adrenal insufficiency, every single person with mixed edema coma needs to get hydrocortisone because if you give someone IV synthroid or IV cytomel. Um, you can provoke an adrenal crisis if they have adrenal insufficiency. And uh, they will say the, the evidence for this, reviewing it today, is, is 
not great, as you can imagine. We don't do all our CTs with people with emphysema coma. Uh, and so you really have to rely on your endocrinologist to tell you about dosing and sort of when to stop this medication. So this should always come with an endocrinology consult, obviously. All right. So this lady gets started on DKA protocol. She gets IV levothyroxine and she gets uh, IV uh, leothyronine T3, and then she gets hydrocortisone, and her blood pressure improves, and her mental status starts to improve. And then, overnight, her blood cultures come back with one of two gram-negative rods, uh, as Prisa expertly pointed out initially. And so, likely, she had an initial UTI causing a bacteremia, um, which may have kicked off all of these things, one of these things, but uh, you can probably assume that all these three things are interrelated somehow. I was right, it wasn't all factorial. So yeah, Guy points out, uh, <laughs> points out for, for full credit that you, this was multifactorial, like most of our patients. <laughs> all right. And because you guys asked for the EKG lab, well, now we're going to show the EKG for just to satisfy our cardiology uh, residents who are always hounding us to show them the EKG. All right, so so as you are uh, evaluating this person, the nurse walks into the room and hands you this EKG, and she says, don't worry, the machine called sinus rhythm, nothing to do. So I give people in the room about 25 seconds to read this, and then I will ask for someone's thoughts. I think, I think I see Osborne Wake, I'm not entirely sure. Which would be consistent with their hypothermia, right? Okay, so he I think he sees Osborne Wake. I will tell him that there are not actually Osborne Wake on the CKG, but it's a good thought he was using his clinical clues. He's close, they're, they're close in, in one in AVL, but not quite. Yeah. Does she have a pacer? She does not have a pacer. Yeah, so Rob, what are you, what are you referring to? Uh, she got arrows up at the top. That look like pacer strike essentially, but they're not really reflect like it's not showing up as a pacer strike really in her leads, which is weird. I'm I'm not sure what's going on up at up at the top. And she looks like she's got some um, I'm starting to figure out what what kind of heart block she has, but she's got some kind of she's got some degree of heart block. Her um PR intervals are pretty variable, but I don't think it's like a winky bock. Um I think she's, she may have third degree. She looks like she's, her R, R just eyeballing it, her R interval looks very regular. I can't say constantly that her P to P interval is super regular, but it may be, and it, it doesn't look like Winky Buck to me, so I'm wondering if this is maybe complete, but I don't know if the arrows are up at the top of the Mercus. Yeah, that's great. So Natalie asked a great question in the chat was, is a rate of 60 relative tachycardia in a patient who's also uh, has a temperature of 31? Uh, probably, um, probably. And the fact that we also know that she has mixed edema coma or decompensated hypothyroidism, yeah, she's probably going faster than you would anticipate. And the reason she might be going faster is Rob actually just read that EKG perfectly. So um, the machine is actually telling you where her P waves are and not her pacer spikes. Okay. And so even though the machine called the sinus, her P waves, as Rob said, her R to R interval marches out essentially perfectly and does not correlate at all with her ventricular beats. So she has AV dissociation with a ventricular escape beat. And Rob, one of, again, one of our third year med peds resident, uh, did a fantastic job and said that this is consistent with complete heart block. So this patient is in complete heart block with a blood pressure of 90 over 50 and not mentating. So what service uh, do you guys want to call? Starts with a C. Starts with a C. So we're going to call cardiology. cardiology. So we call cardiology. Cardiology says, um, interestingly enough, this person does not need any sort of intervention. Correct her underlying problems and see if this gets better. Uh, and this did get better overnight with correcting her um, mixed edema coma, treating her DKA and giving her volume for being uh, significantly dehydrated. So uh, just another good example of don't rely on the machine, 
in all cases, even though it did help point out P waves here, which made this easier to spot. Okay, so real quick, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, let's just talk about uh, myxedema coma because this is something we don't see all the time. So we already talked about treatment, but this person does not have a classic presentation. So uh, what are like the classic myxedema coma symptoms? Pre tibial edema, or you mean symptoms are like, sorry, that was like. Yeah, or exam findings. What are our typical kind of exam findings? So we talked about edema. So great, the pretibial edema. Uh, you can have a large tongue, which they commented on actually in the ED. I didn't tell you that because they would have given it away um, when they thought about intubating her. Total reflexes. Yeah, so uh, decreased reflexes, perfect. Okay, how about lab abnormalities? What are our kind of big lab abnormalities? TSH. <laughs> cool, so we're gonna have a low TSH. Uh, great, that's the easy one. It does not correlate at all with their degree of coma. So you can have a you can have a middling TSH and be sick. You can have a really really low TS, uh, high TSH. Sorry, yeah, yeah high TSH. TSH. <laughs> EA led me astray there. Uh, <laughs> I said I said TSH. I didn't say high to low. I'm gonna let you interpret that. You said the word. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the, the TSH does not correlate with the degree of abnormality. Um, perfect. Uh, what else? Hyponatremia. Awesome. Why are they hyponatremic? <laughs> Is it like a pseudo hyponatremia? Like, it's, well, in her case, it's a PK, okay. but is it a relative adrenal or corticoid uh, deficiency? Yeah, so it's a relative adrenal insufficiency, and they have more ADH on board. So it's kind of a multifactorial hyponatremia. Um, these people also, interestingly enough, tend to be hypoglycemic for the same reason that Rob just mentioned, kind of a relative adrenal insufficiency. Um, uh, but those are sort of the three big ones. So a high TSH, a low uh, low sodium, and low blood sugar. Of course, this one also had DKA. And then, um, uh, and then you guys mentioned it perfectly. So just to reiterate, when you treat these people, you want to give them T4 IV, which is Synthroid. Uh, a lot of people mentioned also giving them T3 IV, but again, this is sort of per endo. And then, as Parissa said, uh, you want to give these people steroids until adrenal insufficiency is ruled out. Uh, and then we talked about this a little bit, but why do people go in to myxedema coma? It'll be triggered by myxedema. Like if you have like UTI or something else, can that like trigger? Yeah, perfect. So, um, these people, as Chris said, these people go into to DK, or mixed and become because of stress. And in fact, sort of an easy way to think about it is uh, just using the five eyes, right? The same things we talk about for uh, the same things we talk about for DKA sort of also apply to mixed coma and sort of any of our endocrine emergencies. So infection, not insulinopenia, but perhaps like inappropriate synthroid administration. Um, Infection, intoxication, or impregnation, and then also being cold can also push you into myxedema coma. Um, so sort of the same reason. Uh, and then Natalie uh, mentioned, uh, would you hold um, would you hold uh, steroids in the setting of? Uh, or Nita said, would you give steroids? Yes. And then uh, Natalie also mentioned, uh, someone mentioned, would you hold steroids in the setting of DKA? And Endo said no. Endo said to go ahead and give the steroids and just increase your insulin level um, to. Uh, to essentially treat the DKA and treat her metabolic and hemodynamic abnormalities. Yeah, and so I think uh, that's Dr. Kearns on the call. Uh, so the steroids are indicated, uh, give the steroids, and then just use higher doses of insulin. So in this case, this person had two significant metabolic emergencies, DKA and uh, decompensated hypothyroidism or mixed edema coma. Uh, she is currently getting better in our ICU uh, and will hopefully uh, be out in the near future with some better care at home. Any questions from the people in the room or uh, the people in the chat? Um, Danny, if she was hemodynamically unstable, um, so whether because of her bradycardia or um, otherwise, um, did cardiology give any recs about like if, if, if this goes poorly, how would we think about this differently other than how we're treating her underlying myxedema? Yeah, great question. So Rob asked, um, she technically was a little hemodynamically unstable. She had a touch of hemodynamic instability when she came in. And so if she had gotten worse, how would we have managed this? And so what cardiology said was to give them a call if her blood pressure remained refractory to high-dose steroids 
uh, high dose um, uh, levothyroxine and uh, fluids and low dose vasopressors essentially, uh, and they would put in a temporary pacing wire to essentially pace her through uh, the resolution of her metabolic abnormalities. But they were very confident in their initial console note that she would get better within hours, uh, sort of that first dose of Synthroid and uh, uh, hydro hydrocortisone. Great question. Any other questions in the chat or from the room? How would you evaluate for adrenal insufficiency if there aren't steroids? How do you evaluate? So the question was, how do you evaluate for adrenal insufficiency if the person is on steroids? Um, Good question. It's tough. So I think uh, I'd have to look into that. But basically, this person got hydrocortisone before the, the, the cortisol level was checked, which complicates things. Um, and so I think you can recheck the level in a couple of days and see what it looks like once you hold, pull back on steroids. Um, or you can just treat them with a short course for a short period of time. Uh, I've seen that once before in the only other patient I had with mixed edema coma and residency. So if you don't check until initially, then you're kind of stuck treating with yeah, so Beery mentions if, if you have that cortisol uh, and you don't check it before they get the first dose of steroids, you're sort of obligated to keep treating them with uh, IV corticosteroids uh, until they're out of the woods. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Uh, everyone have a good day. Uh, let us know feedback on these presentations. Now that we're sort of moving more towards Zoom, we'd love to hear from you guys and whether this works or not. Um, but yeah,